Hello, ladies. Hi. Thank you for coming today and being a part of the Speak Up Inspire series. I wanted to um, thank all of you. Um, all of you have been inspirational to me, and you have all been very um, instrumental in this whole project that I'm doing right now. And without you guys, I would not be able to make this success successful. I need you guys. Um, the whole point of the Speak Up and Inspire series is that we are all giving a voice to domestic violence and sexual assault. And without our voices, we can't help anybody. Sure. So having you guys here today is not only um, inspiring to me, but I also appreciate each and, each and every one of you for being here with me today. Um, I am especially grateful to Ms. Haley for offering her beautiful studio to us. Um, when I first walked into the studio, I was talking to my husband and I said, I need to find a place that's artistic, that is intimate, but it also is empowering. And when I first walked in here, my mouth just dropped um, immediately. I didn't, I didn't even get past the front door. Um, <laughs> I was in the hallway and I started looking around and I was saying, this is amazing. And when you walk in here, it's very comfortable, it's very liberating, um, and just to see the kind of work that you guys do here, um, which I will allow you to talk about, but just the work that you do here, this is not just a tattoo parlor. It's so much more. So can you please tell us more about your vision for your studio and about you? Yes. So. <laughs> My name's Haley Moran, and I've been a tattoo artist in Charlotte for about 17 years now. Um, just almost four years ago, I opened up this studio as a way to make sure that my work as an artist and the community that I was building um, with the people who want to express themselves through tattoo art ended up lining up more with my personal beliefs about the love for humanity and the way that this art form is helping people express themselves and use their voices in this unique way. Um, and to also be a place that when you go to get a tattoo and you know that you are going to experience a little bit of pain, you know, when you're really taking this powerful step in choosing something so permanent like this, that uh, you need to have an artist who wants to listen to you understands where you're coming from and tries to help you really represent um, with, with the artwork uh, where you're coming from in your soul. And so it's important to me to have a place that is comfortable, inviting, and really does help um, everyone, not only just women, even though I have um, all women artists, which I'm very proud to, to host here, um, that it's a way that we all are able to express ourselves in a safe place and help even discover more of who we are. Good. Um, I would like, and this is going to be probably catching you off guard, but I'm sure you'll be able to explain it. Um, I saw in your brochure where women who have had their breasts removed, I'm assuming to breast cancer, can you tell us about that? Yes. Um, several years ago I started uh, a relationship with a plastic surgeon who had wanted a more realistic approach for the women who've experienced cancer and are trying to get that final step towards their healing um, to have more of a realistic three-dimensional replica of the areola and nipple um, and that has expanded more and more into uh, definitely just more creative art and designs and a way that the women can feel more empowered to be kind of back to themselves again or even better than their old selves again um, and so also wanted to really kind of focus on that with this studio as well to provide a, a more intimate environment for the women who've experienced that type of trauma in their lives to be able to kind of renew and start over. And that was dear to me because I'm a breast cancer survivor and so is my mom. Um, thankfully we did not have to go to that extent of um, our treatment by having our breasts removed but many women do. And I, I can't imagine if a doctor said to me that that was an option and it was the best option, I don't know how I would react to that. Um, 
And so when I saw that, that was another reason why I said, you know, this is this is it. And I remember leaving and being very emotional. <laughs> I was walking out and I don't even think I made it to the top of the steps and I just broke down crying. And my husband was like, what's wrong? And I said, this is perfect. It fits the vision, it fits what I was looking to do. So um, thank you again for having us um, and having such an inspirational place. Um, can you give us your the address here and the website? Yes, the address is 1111 Central Avenue. We're at the corner of Central and Hawthorne in Plaza Midwood. And our website is Halo, H-A-Y-L-O, halostudiolounge.com. Thank you. So um, we are filming the pilot today of Speak Up and Inspire. And this has been a vision of mine for a couple of years. And so the, the reason why I felt that it was important for me to have survivors tell their stories on video for us to share is because there are so many women who do not say anything, who do not speak up. And we were just talking about this the other night yeah. at dinner that a lot of victims of domestic violence and sexual assault, but really sexual assault, do not report their assault because they're concerned about, um, one, the rape kit, which is very invasive. Um, and it can, a lot of times, it can re-victimize mm -hmm. a victim after she's just been through something traumatic. Um, we also talked about the fact that there's stigma behind how a rape victim is supposed to respond. Um, and I don't really think that that should be up to police officers or judges or prosecutors or anybody. Um, after being victimized, we all have our own way of coping with things and that's not up for anybody to say that, well, you don't look like a rape victim or um, your, what you had on with him was provocative or um, you know, he's the captain of the football team, he would never do that, or he's your friend, or, you know, even if you're married and you decided to continue your marital arrangement with your husband, that's not up to anybody else. Um, that is up to the victim to grieve and to process what's happened to her in her own way. And so it's scary to a victim to have to speak up when she's worried about all these people that were not hurt, <laughs> were not raped or not assaulted, telling them what being a victim looks like. No one, no one can do that for you. And so it's really scary and it's a lot, it's the reason why a lot of women don't speak up. And it's a lot of reasons why the, um, the attackers are not being prosecuted. Um, because they're being re-victimized by the hospitals and society and police officers and the judge and the criminal system um, and so they don't report it. Um, so I thought it was very important for survivors to speak up, to inspire others to speak up because if we don't speak up and we don't tell our story then these our attackers and our abusers are just walking around there's no consequences, but we are still dealing with the trauma and we're still carrying it. And if nothing is done, then what does that say for us as victims? Um, so I thought it was important that um, we have a platform. All of us are part of platforms outside of this, but I wanted to bring us together. Um, the hope is that this is gonna be a year long project we plan to do it every couple of months, have speakers talk about their, um, their stories. Uh, and we welcome not just women, which most likely that's what you're going to see most of, because a lot of men are, don't come out and talk about their abuse, but we would love to have uh, a male survivor join us for this, um, for this series. And um, I just think that it's very important that we speak up and that we inspire others, that we are a voice to others that cannot speak up. Um, I am a survivor of domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, the sexual assault or the um, abuse started for me when I was very young. 
about, I would say between eight and 10 years old. And it just continued throughout my life of being in abusive relationships and um, being self-destructive because I wasn't healing the way I was um, supposed to or should have, um, to being in an abusive marriage. And it just, the cycle just continued and continued until I had kids myself and said enough is enough. I've got to end this cycle. I can't continue to be a victim. I need to be a survivor and I need to be strong for my daughter and for my son. Um, so that is the, the vision behind Speak Up and Inspire uh, for us to share our voices and hopefully we inspire others to share their stories and help somebody else. So our um, first speaker is going to be Miss Nicolian and she is going to tell us about her story. So, Ms. Nicole, can you just tell us um, very briefly about who you are as a person, and then we would like to hear your story. My name is Nicole, and I'm a hairstylist, makeup artist. I'm also a survivor of domestic violence as well as rape. Pretty much for me, the reason why I feel like it's important to speak up and speak out is, to me, is healing. It's um, displaying life after um, a traumatic situation. It is important that we self-heal first and the only way to do that is to speak out and speak open about it. Um, my situation started I would say about hmm, the first time I was ever molested I would say I was um, I was nine years old, and um, it started with um, an uncle that was married into the family. And um, over the years, I had to be encountered with this person in my family. And um, so, instead of getting counseling or healing, I pretty much, I used to fight a lot behind it. Um, I carried a lot of anger because of it and um, that was my way of healing I guess you know trying to get it out so mm, so after um, going to my mother about it and nothing happened I shut down and I did not talk about it no more and I allowed things to happen to me because I felt like my family wasn't supportive and didn't do anything so um I ended up having sex for the first time at 13 and became pregnant um Hmm, to make a long story short, I realized after, um, at 16 years old, I realized that I didn't have no trust for men at all. I couldn't trust them. And 17, that's when I was violently raped by someone I know. Um, I used to babysit his son and didn't realize, um, didn't realize that I could be violated over and over and um, didn't realize that I kind of allowed certain things to take place because if your family don't stand up and support you, it's almost like, who do you got, who do you have, you know? So when I was raped, I didn't want to tell anyone. Um, it was my roommate that made me, and she the one called the police. And this is when I end up finding out the whole history of um, the man who violated me, and his history was horrible. Um, and I looked at myself like, how could I trust someone, you know, with a past like that? Because he didn't display it, and why didn't I know, you know? Um, 
I was held up at gunpoint. Well, first, let me, he came from a nightclub. He called me and he was like, I'm really, really drunk. Um, what are you doing? And it's four in the morning. And I, I said, I'm asleep, you know. So he said, I really can't drive home. Do you mind driving me? And I'm like, well, we have to go to school. My roommate and I, I really, you know, I'm tired. He was like, but I can't drive home. So I said, okay. I had on, you know, night clothes. I got up and we got there, drove to the house. So I'm like, okay, good. You know, about to allow him to walk in the house. He said, you're not gonna even uh, see me in? So I was like, man, that's what I did. Um, when I got into his home, um, I was like, okay, well, I'm about to go. And that's when he would start telling me how beautiful I look. And I'm like, okay, thought it was weird, but I'm like, okay. Um, then um, he stated, he said, I really just want to have sex with you. And I got to know him. I said, I'm about to leave him. As I went for the door, I heard a closet door open and slam. And that's when he got this gun out. And he held it up. And I said, you tripping? You're drunk. You need to go lay down. And he said, if you don't come in here and take off your clothes, that's when he came closer to me when I tried to ease back to open the door. Um, that's when he got violent with me and punched me. He put that gun down because it was a bigger gun and got um, a handgun, which I was actually beat with. And um, As he was making me take off my clothes, um, I was explaining to him, do you know what you're doing? You know, he didn't want to hear. He told me to shut up and that's when he started punching me in my face. Thank you. And that's when I stopped resisting and he made me lay on the bed and before he raped me, I, I let him know. I said, do you know you're raping me? And um, he punched me in my mouth, and that's when I didn't say anything else. And um, and I endured the, the rape. And um, when I, after he finished, I went and ran in the bathroom. And I remember trying to clean myself up, and then I said, I gotta get out of this house. And I was going to run, and I heard the gun talk and he said by the time you open that door I will have six shots in you and I will throw you in the woods and um so I, I just stayed and part of me I think feel like I rather would have died than to allow him to do this to me um I, But, um, mm. he had the audacity to drive me home. And um, before I got in the, park, the parking lot, I remember just jumping out the car, skinning up my legs. The car was still going, and I just ran. And I ran. And, and my neighbor was out stretching because the apartments that we lived in at the time, they had a pool and it was like a little playground. So my neighbor would stretch every morning. He was out stretching and I just ran him over and fell right in his, the, the way it was, the back door it was right there beside the kitchen. So I just fell into his house in the kitchen area. And that's when he ran and got my neighbor, I mean my roommate and, um, and I told him what happened, and I said, I just want to go home. And um, that's when my roommate decided, no, she was calling the police. As soon as I said his name, um, the police had his house around it because come to find out years later, he was also involved with a police killing. Um, so that's when I got this whole rap sheet but the rape kit when I got to the hospital the rape kit was 
horrific. I felt like I was getting abused all over again. Um, and all I kept hearing, well, we, have, we need to do this to prosecute. We need to do this to prosecute. And I'm like, I don't want to go through this. They had to drug me up because I was badly beaten. So for pain, and all I get is detectives hounding me over and over, wouldn't give me a break, didn't have any type of um, compassion or sympathy. And then, you know, then one uh, detective, Katrina Grout, that's when she came into the picture and it was like a breath of fresh air for me from that point on. But um, even though it's, it's painful for me to relive it, um, I can honestly say the bad part of not getting going through healing sooner and getting counseling is I internalize everything. And um, it's like I stated, I acted out in rage and anger. Someone said anything to me, it was it because, and if anybody tried to ever threaten me, I, I just lose it for that fact because I said never again will I allow anybody to violate me in that way. Um, it, it was, I waited till I was 36 to even go to counsel and my children had to endure my constant pain. I couldn't, um, they didn't understand why I was always so angry, you know. Um, my daughter used to say, Mom, you really need to go to counseling, but unfortunately, in, in our community, it was like counseling was for crazy people. But to be honest, we kind of make ourselves go crazy not seeking counseling in some form of way. Um, so I was 36 when I finally went to counseling. I am still healing even though it hurts. But I can honestly say, talking about it is therapeutic. Talking about it is taking my power back. Crying about it is even cleansing. Um, there is life after. There's a healthy life if you seek to choose to 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 go through counseling or do what it takes to, you know, get the healing that's needed. If not. That's where depression comes in. That's where suicidal thoughts come in. Um, and you do close yourself in. Um, so I, I encourage everyone to speak out. I encourage people to, to take something that pretty much could have destroyed you in every way possible and use it as power to uplift, to heal, and to bring awareness to other people. Um, when I met Napoleon, we met um, and I immediately felt her spirit and I immediately um, could feel that she was a powerful, strong woman. One of the first stories that she told me about um, was about your son. Mm -hmm. So can you please tell us about that experience with your son? Um, my son, okay, before I bring that up, can I also say one thing? Another reason it is important to get healing is because you have, when you have children, they are affected. <laughs> and just like I stated, um, I was also after the the rape, I was in a domestic violence a relationship, but for the longest, I didn't think it was, the, you know, I was a domestic violence victim because I felt like, oh, I fought back, you know, oh, I'm not just going to let someone hit me, but the fact that I had to fight is, you know, shows that um, I'm a victim of it and never looked at it that way. So, therefore, my son, my daughters had to see um, 
fighting, you know. I can also say from this and be very transparent to also say I was on both sides of the fence. I was the abuser as well as a victim. Um, and when my son got into a, um, a relationship where it was abuse both ways, um, at the time we met, it was more severe because my son ended up, um, actually he was dead for six days. He was on complete life support, um, no brain activity at all. And that's what started me to get into and start the, the foundation of MAD. And at the time, it was Mothers Against Domestic Violence. And I said, no, I don't want this just for mothers. And, and I wanted to turn it into a movement for domestic violence. Um, and, and my thing was not just for the victims, but who helps the abusers? If everyone is just reaching out to the victims, the abuser goes on to abuse someone else. So my thing, I wanted to not just help the victims, but I really wanted to get a hold on the abuser. Mm -hmm. So that's where that came about. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Miss Tanil. <laughs> so Tanil, Tanil is our, our other speaker who came out today and. I met Tanil when I was looking to do some volunteer work, um, and I will let you tell. Sure, <laughs> um, but I started, or I met Miss Tanil when it was when I was looking for opportunities to do volunteer work, and then you admitted to me that you too had a story. Um, and what I think is interesting when I'm out in the community and I'm talking to people. Um, and I'm sharing my story is how many people come up to me and say that they have a story and um, it's no longer shocking because it seems like we're finding more and more people that have been in domestic violence situations or have been assaulted or they have been raped and it's, it's really sad that so many women and men are able to say that they have been victims of domestic violence or sexual assault. Um, but it, that's the other reason why this is important that we talk about it. So can you tell us about you and who Ms. Tenille is and um, share your story? So I am Tenille. I um, actually met Fedney, as she said, she was interested in um, getting involved in doing some volunteer work to help victims and survivors. And um, we make that contact through um, Safe Alliance, which is where I currently work. Um, and that is an organization, it's a local nonprofit that helps victims and survivors of domestic and sexual violence. Um, but just as you said, I felt your spirit when we were talking and um, it turned into so much more than just a work and professional piece for me. And, learning about what you do and, and why you're doing it, it inspired me. So, um, I um, grew up with a mom who had me at a very early age. My mom um, grew up in a household, she and her sister, where my grandmother was abused. And um, there's several different reasons why I may exist, but I think part of just her way of coping with being in that environment was um, having me. And growing up as a young female, it, for me, I think it's important just to speak up because so many people are impacted by domestic violence and you, um, oftentimes we focus on the, the person who's being abused themselves, which is definitely important but so many others are impacted by it. Um, as Nicole had mentioned, your, your children, and it, it's something that impacts generation after generation if families don't deal with things that are happening. Um, and that's something my mom and I talk about quite often is 
sometimes our families just aren't willing to talk about things and those deep dark secrets or things that we hold in are the things that drive everything that's going on and, and why sometimes there's such struggles. Um, so fortunately my you know, mom has been very open with me about that and I think that's helped shape who I am but at the same time um, knowing that history of my family it made it hard for me to trust people growing up and um, for a very long time kind of feeling like maybe boys at the time were men as I got older um, you should just stay away from them period because they're all bad and this is going to happen to me too um, and fortunately I was fortunate enough to meet my husband when I went to college and he's the one who showed me differently. Yeah. But um, on a separate note, um, I'm also a victim of sexual assault or rape more so. Um, when I was in college at 18 years old, I was a freshman and um, some friends and I decided to um, hang out with some guys one night. Um, they were some of the basketball players at the school and um, so some friends of my, from my dorm and I decided to hang out with them after being invited over just to play games and have a good time. Um, so we went to their apartment on campus and um, spent quite a bit of time there and everybody had a good time. There was nothing bad or no bad feelings in the air, nothing like that. We were just all having a great time hanging out. Um, doing what teenagers do. And it got pretty late into the night, um, probably like around 12.30, 1 a.m. Um, by the time we realized how late it was. And at that point, we all, you know, just decided maybe we shouldn't go back to our dorm that night. And um, two of the guys said, well, we'll sleep on the couch. You guys can just stay in our bedroom. Um, so my friends and I agreed to do that and we felt safe and didn't see anything wrong with it. Um, Later, throughout that night, a different guy on that basketball team who stayed in the apartment um, literally woke me up in the middle of the night and came and drug me out of the bed. Um, drug me to his room, and by the time I kind of woke up to realize what was happening, I tried, you know, pulling away, but he grabbed my wrist so tight I couldn't break free. And he took me in his room and laid me on his bed and held me down so tough and so hard that I couldn't break free. Um, at first I thought about screaming and yelling to wake everybody up, um, but then at the same time he was so forceful, this fear came over me that if I got other people involved and got those other girls awake to the point that they knew what was happening, what would he do to them? So I just kind of stayed there and, and kept telling him no and trying to push him off of me and he wouldn't stop. So I just allowed him to do what he needed to do. Um, and then immediately got up and left and just went back to my room. Um, to this day, my husband, who was a friend of mine on campus at the time, is the only person I've ever told this story to um, openly. I've shared it with a few clients and others that I've um, encountered at work, but I've never even told my family about it. Um, my husband, of course, was tremendously angry and wanted to go and handle it in whatever way he saw fit and um, encouraged me to tell people, but it just wasn't something I wanted to share. And the reason for that is just what um, you said earlier. So many times people are victimized, but then they're re-victimized because people blame them for it. And all that kept going through my head was I put myself in that situation. I chose to stay there. Um, and that's all I saw coming out of it. If I told someone that those were going to be the questions that were asked. Why Why were you there in the first place? You knew it was late at night. Why would you put yourself in that situation? Um, and then also being a prominent athlete on campus, was anybody really going to care? Because that was something that was going to impact more than just me if I got that person in trouble. 
Um, what has haunted me, though, by not telling what happened, is always wondering, did this happen to someone else because I didn't speak up about it? Um, and oftentimes we see time and time again where somebody finally gets the courage and the guts to come out about a person and then you find out, well, they've done this to several other people before. Um, but it took that one person having the courage to say enough is enough and I'm not okay with this happening to me. Um, so I don't know the answer to that question, but it's something that always sits in the back of my mind and I hope and pray that no one else had to endure that. Um, but an another lesson I guess I, I t take from this is just um, something Nicole Ian shared and I, I agree. Um, I'm here to be a mother myself and this is a new experience for me in life, but I hope as a mom, and I know had I told my mom, she would have encouraged me and did whatever she needed to do to help me. I can be there to support my child if heaven forbid something horrible happened to them. But how can I do that if I'm not willing to be honest about my own experience? Yeah. Um, so I just think it's important for people to speak up because secrets, they don't go away. They just continue to haunt you. And um, it is healing to talk about things. It is um, therapeutic and, and it just releases you of that burden that you're holding on for some something that you shouldn't even have to be burdened by in the first place. Um, so that's my story and that's why I do what I do <laughs> and um, work to serve victims of domestic and sexual violence every day um, because I think it's important to encourage others and let others know that help is available and if you um, everybody's not quite ready to tell their story yet but at least knowing that it's okay to do so when you are is important so um, I do have a question so mm -hmm. you work at Safe Lines mm -hmm. so if there's someone who um, you do handle domestic violence and sexual assault mm -hmm. at Safe Lines so if a person is a victim of domestic violence. What, from your experience, what should they do? If they are a victim of domestic violence, they're ready to get out, what are their next steps? Great question. <laughs> um, so, I can give, tell you what I think they should do, but at the same time, it's different for everybody. Um, every situation is different and every person is different. and. I think it's important for people to know, no matter what someone's going through, unless you're that person, you can't really tell them what's best for them. Um, so that first and foremost. But um, having a plan is really, really important. If you are thinking about leaving a, a dangerous relationship, um, statistics show that it becomes more dangerous when you finally take that step to, to leave. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of the homicides that occur in abusive relationships happen when someone's trying or just recently left. Um, so it's important to have a plan, whether that's uh, coming into shelter or knowing a family or friend or supportive um, person you can go and be with. Um, having those important documents and, and things that you need to be able to move forward, um, your prescriptions and all of that kind of stuff. Um, Oftentimes I see people come into shelter and they had to hurry up and leave because their physical safety was the, the main issue, but they forgot about that prescription medication or their child's you know, birth certificate or whatever it is, so then they're hindered um, from that point on until they can get those things worked out. Um, and oftentimes you can't go back and get it. So. Um, just really having a plan and, and if you don't know what that plan looks like, you can call the Hotline at Safe Alliance and um, get help with safety planning, that's what we call it, where you can kind of figure out how you take those next steps. Um, I do encourage um, people to get police involved if, if need be because even though um, sometimes we don't always want to call police. Um, they have officers who have been trained to handle these situations and who know um, what to look for and the signs of abuse and that kind of thing. So 
um, even if you're not always upfront as to why you called them, nine times out of ten they can pick up on it and, and know what's really going on and, and get you to a safe place. Um, so how many women do you on average house at the shelter? So um, annually we house about eight to nine hundred women and children every year. Um, typically we have about 120 at any given time staying at shelter. Um, and a good majority of the residents we have are children, unfortunately. Um, yeah. And you also help sexual assault victims. Mm -hmm. So how is that process after a victim comes to you? What is, what is the process? So we help um, sexual assault victims in several different ways. We um, have our hotline where it's just a tool that people have available to them where they can call and um, just talk if they need to, or um, if they're having a rough night or need advice, that kind of thing. That's what the hotline's for. Um, we also provide companionship, so um, rape crisis companions. So if someone has to go through those horrible experiences of having a rape exam done, um, we have trained um, staff and volunteers who will come out and be with them at the hospital to just help them get through that time. They need something to drink or whatever the case might be. Um, but then we also do um, advocacy work with them, and that's from the point of um, helping them once they've decided, yes, I want to seek justice or whatever the case may be, helping them stay in touch with the police detectives and um, talking to the DAs and making sure they know what's going on with their case and it's not just kind of lost and, and no communications happening there. Well, before we take a break, um, I just have a question. Um, and I'm sure this might be a question that our guests might have asked, but I want to go ahead and ask now. Um, your experience that you had where you were sexually assaulted by gunpoint and so forth, you said that the police surrounded his home. So was he ever prosecuted for your assault? He was not prosecuted for my assault for the simple fact of they stated that because I chose to have sex in a certain amount of time, it, I, a rape victim, is what they said, wouldn't have had sex that soon. What they didn't know is I had a, what you would consider as a companion who had told me her name is Miss Robin, who stated that not only she was losing her family because she could not even sleep with her husband, um, she was going through a divorce because she didn't even enjoy sex anymore. She literally was basically celibate after that. Mm -hmm. um, she told me if even knowing the traumatic that was the trauma I was going through, if I did not have sex, then I will allow it to do the same thing to me. And she said the only way, you know, and she was dying like, don't let this happen to you, you know. She even went further on telling me she will allow her husband to sleep with other women because she couldn't do it. So I didn't want that to be my life. And when I chose to when I chose to have, and of course, let me um, also say it was not the best experience at that time for me, but I chose to do it. And I'm just grateful that, I'm, I'm just grateful that he was supportive in that, that time. I'm I have a bond with my youngest daughter. I have a bond with all my children, but my youngest daughter who is here, I have a bond with her because um, I was pregnant with her when I was going through that, you know? Um, and she, she was a twin. And um, I think that's one of the reasons I lost her twin. Um, and I, they said I was going to lose her too, but she's here, so.
so. I think um, she, she's just amazing. And she, <laughs> she, um, she she's fought she's too. She's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry that he um, was not prosecuted for what happened to you. And mm. especially the reason yeah. was because you chose to be intimate again mm -hmm. with your partner. Yeah. That doesn't take away from the fact that you were raped. Yeah. And that's not a, a reason to not prosecute. So I'm very sorry that that happened to you. Yeah. One, um, if I can also add one mm -hmm. thing I, I, I encourage, and this is one of the reasons why I link back up, what, like I was telling you, she's now a deputy chief, uh, Katrina Grau, is because I encourage the officers to be compassionate. I encourage the DA to don't judge and tell someone what you think a victim should be because every victim is different. Um, every victim handles things differently. So, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I also chose to go further and speak out because of that. Okay. Thank I don't you. want anyone else to walk free after doing something like that. And they shouldn't. And they should, yeah. You're right. Ms. Tenille, um, you said that you did not tell anyone. So then that means that your attacker um, went free, quote unquote. Um, but now that um, this is years later and you know what you know now and you've been educated and um, you know, you help other victims. If you could change that night, do you think you would have spoken up or do you think you might have still kept it to yourself? Knowing what I think about that all the time <laughs> and knowing what I know now, um, I still don't think I would have spoke up in the sense of getting a rape at say, um, um or anything like that, but I definitely would have um, made it known right. to um, school officials and, and police um, and, and been more open with my family and told them about it just to have that support because those who know me, um, I ended up leaving school like a year later and just went through some rough times here and there. Um, and. For anyone who wasn't close to me, it probably seemed like I was my normal self because I'm good at just doing what I need to do and pushing through and going on about my business. Um, but if you ask my mom or others, they probably had no idea why I was acting the way I was or dealing with depression and, and different things like that and, and handling things in the way I chose to. Um, but knowing this, it probably all makes sense now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it just would have been nice to, now that I think about it, at the time I didn't think that's what I wanted, but it probably, um, if I could do it over again, I, I would have at least told more of my family um, to have that support system and, and told the school to ensure that hopefully that person was prevented from doing this to someone else. And one of the people you did tell is now your husband. <laughs> Kudos to him. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and take a break um, and let the, the guests hug and support our ladies that are sharing their story. Um, and then we will come back and we will wrap things up here for the Speak Up and Inspire series. <laughs>
speak up and inspire. Um, so we took a break to kind of fellowship and get our emotions back in check and everything. And I think everyone um, is feeling really great about our first series. I think so. I think yes. it went really well. Um, I think what makes us unique is that there was no script. Right. <laughs> we just talked. So we had to say what was on our hearts. And I think that's the best way to, to be transparent and to be honest. And I think that's um, something else that we are doing this for so that people feel that they can be open and they can be transparent and they can tell their stories. Um, so we wanted to open up uh, this time right now for the guests that have come to support us. Um, all of these people here that came to support us are significant in our lives and having them here was very important and I wanted to take a moment to say that um, I'm married and my husband is here. He has been so supportive of me on this journey, um, very understanding and I'm finding that whenever I do speaking engagements, <laughs> like I'm talking about my story, because I have so much trauma in my life and so many things that have happened to me, that sometimes he's hearing things for the first time. And so I was saying to him the other day, I said, I don't have like a list of trauma, my trauma list, that I can just start checking off and telling him. So sometimes he's hearing things for the first time, like he did yesterday um, when I was talking, but he, he takes it, I, I can see the expressions on his face, mm -hmm. and um, and he, he keeps it moving, and we talk about it later. Um, so he's been very, very supportive, so I wanted to say thank you to my okay. husband for being supportive. <laughs> um, Tanil's husband is here as well, and as we said earlier, he was actually one of the friends at the time, I'm assuming, were y'all dating mm -hmm. then? We all just friends. Oh, there. Yeah, okay. Okay. So they were just friends, um, but he was her support system after her assault, um, and now he's her husband. And I think that that sh says a lot about the type of man he is. Yeah. Um, that he was willing to be there as your friend, as your support system, and I'm sure he probably wanted to kick somebody's <laughs> tail um, to protect you, but now he's your husband, and I'm. I'm pretty sure that that um, is something that has been helpful for you. And I'm sure that strengthens your bond and keeps your bond strong. Because um, I, I don't know how my husband would be able to handle that if he met me during my trauma. Um, so I'm, I'm very thankful that you had your husband there for you. Um, and hot, like, all of a sudden. <laughs> um, I'm glad that you had your husband there for you um, through the whole thing, and now you um, have a little along the way. So <laughs> I wanted to make sure I spoke up and spoke of him as well. Um, so we want to open up the floor, and if there's any guests that would like to ask any questions or if they would like to say anything, um, we'll do that right now. I want to speak up because this is something um, that I've seen time and time again. I've seen the effect many women and normally that is the case I know it goes the opposite way at times but it seriously frustrates me because most of these police officers that these women are seeing are are men and they're the ones that are blowing it off acting as if it's not a big deal and I feel as if we as men literally have to take responsibility for this I don't understand I've never I've never struck a woman I've never had the intention to um, to do that myself, but I, I seriously feel that we have to do something. Like it has to be on us because we're the ones that are allowing this to happen over and over again. Um, and if you're a man and you don't have that same feeling or, or passion about this, um, I, I really, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm lost for words. I don't know how we can allow it to go. I, I, I can attest to this myself. I found out that my friend uh, abused his girlfriend. I literally, I, and I'm not saying, not to not to advocate violence versus violence, but I went in my own friend, like, and I'm not saying it to, to 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 tell others to to actually go and to go back to another victim or go after the after the abuser and go and, and take action in that way. But we have to find some means to to corral this and make sure that they're held accountable for it. So, so. 
uh, piggybacking on the police situation. Uh, do you think also um, the, the stories too, and even like the, where the female cops are the same way? Do you think they have to be kind of trained to kind of kind of step back too and say, I mean, they may, they may feel the same the same intensity. Oh, that's a that, good point. You know, that sometimes they may be like, hey, I gotta think like a robot. Not that I don't care. Yeah. But, you know, and I'm not big on the police <laughs> by any means. <laughs> but, but you know, yeah. not, not that you know. But you still need, you know, we still need them for the help or stuff. That's like a that. great point. Yeah, and, and and I also want to ask too. Uh, well, when you guys were going to the police, um, was the the way the police, you know, since they had to kind of be like robots with it sometimes, was that like kind of stopping you from moving forward or? or and how did you kind of go around, or you know, I don't know how I'm at, what I want to ask. Oh, okay. I, yeah, I definitely get what you're asking. The men were very nonchalant, um, uncompassionate. They they pretty much treated me like another number. Um, it was only when uh, Katrina Grau, now she's a deputy chief now. And when she came in, she showed the compassion. She didn't look at it. And, and I'm going to be honest, she uh, is a Caucasian woman, okay? And she didn't look at my race. She didn't look at, you know, anything else. She treated me like a human being. And that's when she the one helped me to keep pushing. Because if I had to deal with just the other officers and detectives, I wouldn't have. I was doped up on a lot of medication because I was beat and they would still hound me. Wake up, we need you to tell, you know, you don't do that to a victim who has been traumatized. And yeah, she she's amazing. One thing I can honestly say she is working with that. She asked me to come to also help far as talk to different officers about showing the compassion and, and the care and stop thinking that every victim is going to react the same way because that's not the case. Well, in my case, um, my father was the police officer the first <laughs> the first time. Um, I lost my virginity to rape um, by two guys in the neighborhood. And I didn't tell my parents until a year later. Um, I told my best friend and sh I swore her to secrecy. <laughs> she kept my secret for a while until um, one night I was looking at a movie of a girl being assaulted and I was actually watching the movie with my parents and I just lost it. And so I told them what happened to me and my father left the house, went to the guy's house that, that raped me and I never saw the boy again. Never. So I don't know what my dad did, <laughs> but for, for me, he was my police officer and he, whatever he did, he went and he talked to the, the boy's parents and I never ever saw him again. Never even heard him mentioned or nothing. Um, the second, the guy that was there, he didn't physically rape me, but he held me down and stood outside the door. Um, he was a neighbor of ours, so I never told my parents who he was because I felt that my dad would have killed him because they were friends of the family. Um, so I never told my parents that about his involvement, but I did tell them about the other boy who actually was the one that raped me. Um, but the second time that I was um, that I was raped, I knew the guy, and we were all at the house, and I fell asleep, and he attacked me, and he raped me, and I did go to the police. He was. Uh, best, he was the brother of, of my best friend. So I was scared to go to the police because I didn't want to hurt her family. Um, but I went through it. I went through the rape kit. Um, I did what I was supposed to do. I told, my, I told them what happened. And they did not prosecute him. They didn't prosecute him because we knew each other and we had dated briefly before. And they basically made it seem like it, it was consensual and that I just got mad at him and that's not what happened. Um, so I I had the courage to go to the police, she had the courage to go to the police and nothing happened to our, our rapist. So um, the the officers treated me kind of the same way. You know, well, did y'all date before? Yes. Did y'all have sex before? Well, yes. Uh, 
So you mean to tell me that he just came in the room and did that? I was asleep and he attacked me and he was a big guy. And yes, he did rape me. And I was very matter of fact, I didn't change my story. And I believe you told me you didn't change your story. <laughs> they didn't even, they didn't prosecute him. So um, the, the officers definitely need to be trained in compassion. And you know, I understand what you're saying about the, the whole, maybe they have to take their personal out of it. But when they do that, they're showing us a disservice as victims mm -hmm. when they act like they don't, they don't care or something like that. So they need to be trained in empathy and oh. compassion and you know the questions to ask, giving us space mm -hmm. and giving us time to to be able to gather our thoughts and our words because that can be a very um, what's the word I'm saying intimidating mm -hmm. moment when they're asking you all of these questions and you're still your body is still in shock your mind is still in shock and here they are coming at you with a whole bunch of questions mm -hmm. and you know a lot of times the questions are misleading it is. so so yeah that was yeah that was our thing mm -hmm. i think the police role is important and i think our police department is doing a good job overall trying to train and officers and put that into place um, but there's still room to grow. Um, but the other part that goes with that, police aren't the only ones making these decisions. Sometimes they're doing their work, their work as detectives and getting the evidence and all of that, mm -hmm. but then there's the legal system. Mm -hmm. um, and I tell people every day in the work that I do, these issues impact us all. You don't have to be the one who's abused or be the actual victim for it to impact you. And we all have opportunity to go to those ballot boxes um, right. when it's time to vote and elect those judges and elect those district attorneys and um, people who are put into office to, to change the laws that we have. Um, that alone would make a big difference in a lot of people's outcomes because um, just in North Carolina alone, a lot of people don't know the definition legally we, you know, that's not saying what someone defines their experience is, but the legal definition for rape in our state is that it has to be um, penetration of a penis into a vagina. So that already says males can't be raped. It says that if you're assaulted with some other um, object or, or thing, that wasn't rape, it's just sexual assault. So um, it's lots of other things that play into it as well. This is very powerful. As, as that's probably the best word I can use. Um, when Tiffany came to me about this project, um, I'm still kind of learning about, you know, the how intense this stuff is, the domestic violence and sexual assault. I didn't know it was this big. I didn't know the legal aspects of it. Um, I didn't know it was affecting so many people. So, um, and then even just kind of learning her story. So, um, just like she said, like, we had a speaking engagement yesterday and she spoke about some stuff about, I didn't even know. And the ladies looked at me, she's like, did you know this about Tiffany? And I'm like, uh, I'm not learning right now, it's okay. <laughs> so um, it's very important to, uh, to me as her partner, as her husband, to really have her back on something like this, um, just because of how important it is to her, because this is the, the after part, this is the, the rebuild, this is the life after the abuse, you know, it's, <laughs> It's worth it, you know what I mean? Like it's you know, it's not that she can't have that, you know, now she's picking up the pieces and moving forward. So, you know, who's to say she can't have a husband, kids, family, all of that, that nice support system, you know, it's very, very important. So, um, when it comes to to speaking about this stuff, when it comes to this project, you know, I'm I'm her number one fan, I'm her cheerleader. I'm her designer. I'm, I'm picking out her clothes, what she's gonna wear. You know, I'm letting her, baby, wear these shoes with this necklace. You know what I'm saying? It's gonna work right. And so, and, and I do all of her, her graphics, her business cards, her flyers, uh, shirts, whips. I do all of her stuff. And you know, because I don't know what kind of role I can play. I, you know, I, I can't say that I've experienced what she's experienced. So, you know, I, to, to what I can do, and I'm gonna do it to the best of my abilities, just to show her my support. So, um, you know, just, just them speaking up is, is very important. Um, I think uh, the changing point for me was going to Safe Alliance. Um, I don't know how all that kind of works out. You know, if, you, if 
if you ever went, you know, if you could try to go, these women there, um, some of them are young. Young kids, they got kids there, they got like little daycare there, so, you know, they gotta get their kids. One lady I saw, she had like one leg. I mean, it was, it was, it was very moving. So um, Tiffany did a, a panel. Then she had a couple people there and they were speaking to these girls and they were telling them their stories and they're telling them about coming up with a plan after the fact. What are you gonna do now? You know, you know, some of them are still living in that. Some of them haven't escaped. Some of them are still victims. So, you know, it's just, the, what do you do after that? What do you do with that? And um, just seeing how they responded to these stories um, was very, very moving, you know. Um, and I'm not, you know, to throw any names out there, but one of the, uh, the panelists, the way she spoke to them, it was, it was like they had to live what she was saying. You know, she, she told them, you know, close your eyes and I want you to, you know, visualize what I went through. And she described it and it really moved those girls. You know, one girl in particular, she came to her afterwards and she was crying and she's like, you know, I'm, I'm ready to beat this. You know, what do I need to do, you know, with this plan? And she you know, kind of helped her with a plan. Now the girl's got a job and she's looking for an apartment. And that's that's huge. That's huge, whatever. And that's that voice. You know, to be able to speak out because there's other people out there and they don't have that voice. So it's, it's very important. So I'm, I'm just glad to be a part of it. I just want to say thank you to everybody that came. I really appreciate your support. Um, I want to thank each of, each of you, um, Ms. Haley, for letting us do this again here at Halo. Ms. Tenille. Um, you not only work at Safe Alliance, but you're also a survivor. And I think that's really important when working with victims is when you are a survivor. I think that, that adds a piece that victims need. So thank you for not only working here, but also sharing your story as well. And Ms. Nicole, mm -hmm. thank you for coming and sharing your story as well. I really appreciate it. And I think that the, the ladies here today, you definitely set the tone for my vision for the series. Um, I couldn't be happier. I'm very, very, very honored that you guys are here today. <laughs> um, this is a dream come true for me. So we have a plan for it to go a year. We've already talked about some follow-up things that we want to do together. Um, that I'm really looking forward to. I'm not going to say it, <laughs> but you will see it's coming. <laughs> there will be a follow-up. Um, not just the second series, but we're going to spin off some other things. Um, and I'm really excited about that. So I have some gift bags for you guys. This is for Ms. It's not much, but we had some people that sent in some things for you guys. Um, and to show appreciation for what we were doing. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, I want to thank our guests again for coming. And could our guests please give them a round of applause for sharing this? Ha, 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 ha.